might be tragic <laughs> in, in what happens. However, please understand that I do not control what others send to me. Where do I, I do that? So, I'm going to give this a try because it's a treaty education video. I used to come out and, and try to explain 400 years of Mi'kmaq history and treaty education and everything in, in one hour presentation. And when I went to the videos, people, Jeff Fish, Kathy Brown, I said, I need you to take the entire 400 year history of Mi'kmaq and, and what we're doing in treaty education and put it into 10 minutes. And he said, well, we'll try. And, and so this is the, what we were able to do in, in a 12 minute span. So. Keep in note what I said, and we're going to try this and see how it rolls. Treaties have purpose. They define. They forge. They build. Treaties are living documents. They have shaped this province. And this nation. They shape our way of life. Treaties affect us all. We are all treaty people. The Mi'kmaq are Indian. The Mi'kmaq are First Nations. The Mi'kmaq are Aboriginal. The Mi'kmaq are Indigenous. But we're still Mi'kmaq. We're a nation. A lot of people, when you think of Canadian history, you know, it's relatively short compared to you know, the rest of the world. <laughs> It's not, right? We've been in existence for 13,500 years. Before European contact, we lived off the land and had access to natural resources, had access to fishing and hunting. Mi'kmaq ancestors have brokered their own alliances long before European arrival, and many more since. Mi'kmaq have formed the Wabanaki Confederacy with the Maliseet, Pasmaquoddy, Penobscot, and Abenaki. Entered into a broader alliance with the Iroquois and the Odawa, alliances that lasted for centuries. Maintained a consistent peace with the French until their displacement by Britain, and even entered into a concordat with the Vatican in 1610. treaties and when we try to understand treaties we have to understand the original spirit and intent of the treaties so that we understand a better perception of history. Starting in the mid-1700s, British and Mi'kmaq signed a series of treaties which outlined terms of peace and friendship between our peoples based on the mutual goals of cooperation and respect. All transactions during the late war shall on both sides be buried in the oblivion with the hatchet, and that the said Indians shall have all favor, friendship, and protection shown them from this, His Majesty's government. The treaty isn't just a piece of paper. The treaty was a solemn act. That was a new day. That was the burying of the hatchet. In return, the Mi'kmaq chief would acknowledge the jurisdiction and dominion of King George over the territories of Nova Scotia. The common misconception is, is that treaties signed away land and resources. But well, this is the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. This is the land that we had never gave up. We never surrendered it. It was signed between the kings and queens of countries in Europe and our people here, and they recognized us as an independent nation. Nor was this about secession or weakness. Mi'kmaq controlled the land and the coast, and the British needed help to settle and live here safely. Mi'kmaq were a considerable fighting force at the time when the treaties were signed. And the Mi'kmaq leaders wanted the establishment of secure and well-regulated trade. The treaties grant you full rights to hunt, fish, and trap anywhere in all of Mi'kmaq. Respect the land, share the land, and work collectively together. Alliances, trade, relationships. Essentially, all of these treaties were about two groups willing to share. So the treaties are the building blocks for our relationship here, or for our shared lived experience here. We're all descendants of treaty people. And that means we all have duties and obligations as treaty people. Since these treaties, there's so many things that happened to Aboriginal people in Canada. 
And that's why we have things like the blanket ceremony. The blanket exercise is this interactive tool that illustrates 500 years of colonial history with Europeans and uh, indigenous peoples. With the Kairos blanket exercise, we go through a script which discusses the impact of colonization. And so we talk about the issues and the problems that indigenous people have faced and continue to face. One of the things that unfortunately happened was that there was an expansion within the British Empire. The entire British Empire grew by about 15 times. The Europeans were, were coming in, they wanted more permanent settlements here. The Mi'kmaq traveled with the season where the resources were most plentiful, and the, the loyalists would come and the Mi'kmaq would return to find all of these people taking up their land. Over time, the balance of power shifted towards indigenous peoples devolved into one endorsing isolation and cultural genocide. The issues and the problems that indigenous people have faced include the 60s scoop, loss of status for women uh, due to the Indian Act, the formation of reserves in general, centralization, <laughs> residential schools, taking children away from their parents and, and forcing them into schools so that they forget their identity. My father served for two countries, the United States and, and the Canadian Forces. He was that tough guy, but yet uh, I could see him kind of choke up talking about his experiences in the residential schools. For years, the Mi'kmaq had to deal with laws that said that they couldn't assemble to talk about their rights, that they couldn't get educated or they'd lose their Indian status, they couldn't get university degrees, they couldn't become lawyers, they couldn't become doctors, or they would lose who they were. The Mi'kmaq couldn't get justice. It has affected our children and our grandchildren for seven generations. Today, we're on these small reserves which make up less than 1% of all of Canada. We have communities without drinking water. We have some of the highest rates of suicide. When it comes to education, when it comes to health, when it comes to children in care, not only aren't Indigenous people getting over and above what your average Canadian gets, but we're getting 30 to 40 percent less. 1969, the Union of Nova Scotia Indians got together and began doing the actual research within treaties. Donald Marshall Jr., when he got caught fishing, he said because of the treaties, we had a right to, uh, to fish and to sell those fish. In 1985, James Matthew Simon from the community of Sibbing Nagati took this issue all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. R.V. Simon was the first federal case in Canada to argue a right based on a treaty. Then, the ruling came down. These treaties demonstrate an enforceable obligation between the Indians and the Crown. That day was a major turning point for Mi'kmaq rights in Canada. It was such joy. It was wonderful. The magnitude of this decision cannot be understated. Treaties could now shape government policy. They could heavily influence government agendas. And they could have a lasting impact on our communities. Treaties, they call them the covenant chain. One linked to the other made it stronger. This chain remains unbroken today. So that's why we recognize and affirm the treaties each day on October 1st. Years later, we went fishing with Junior, and I said, wow, this is the man. This is the man that allowed us to fish. I thanked him. Even today, right here. Is a great dad. That's what it means. The Supreme Court decision alone wasn't going to change anything, unless there was a change to people's perceptions. The majority of Nova Scotians didn't learn about treaties in their history. The majority of Nova Scotians grew up believing that these treaties weren't worth the paper they were written on. Even on reserve, we didn't have Mi'kmaq courses, we didn't have language courses. We sort of focused on indigenous peoples as being here when the first settlers first arrived and then sort of just disappearing off the radar. I heard about the weak mom said that we once lived in, but that was pretty much it though. It's a sense of community and the roots to the people's clans 
all that was missing. That's exactly why we need tree education. Tree education is, is teaching all Canadians on, on who the Mi'kmaq are, where we've come from, and, and how we can kind of all move forward together. Never again will Indigenous history not feel integral to Canadian history. Reconciliation is not an Aboriginal issue. It's a Canadian issue. We had to get all the stakeholders in the, in the room, the educators, the elders, the youth, the leadership, the people working for government. We said, can we develop a plan for treaty education moving forward? And it was from that we were able to put a comprehensive treaty education strategy in place. Then we were able to advocate and turn that into an MOU between the Mi'kmaq and the province that was signed in 2015. just the Mi'kmaq ones. Treaty education will cover four topics. Who are the Mi'kmaq? Why are treaties important? What happened to the treaty relationship? How can we reconcile our shared history? Teaching people it's not Indigenous history, it's Canada's history. And, and that's a benefit for all people, no matter what their background is. Treaty education is not just for in the schools, it's for businesses, it's for government, it's for the public sector, it's for everyone. Culture is so rich, and, and there's a lot to be shared. Our worldview, our indigenous knowledge, our contributions to Canada. The knowledge that's been here for thousands and thousands of years has been held by the Mi'kmaq in trust for everyone. If you want treaty education to succeed, your message cannot be about bitterness, anger, or resentment. Your message has to be about hope and moving forward together. What needs to happen is we need to be that dream catcher generation. The dream catcher catches the bad dreams and lets the good ones flow through. A lot of those, those feelings uh, get passed down through different generations. I want that to stop with me so it doesn't pass on to the next generations. Reconciliation itself refers to repairing the relationship that is broken. There's a huge strain on the relationship that we have. Both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people need to work together to rebuild that relationship. We need to build allies. We need to build relationships. We need to focus on the positiveness. And that's one of the things about sharing. Uh, and one of the seven sacred teachings that Aboriginal people have. It's about sharing and showing respect. And that's what we need to be able to do. To have a responsibility for the next seven generations to come. There's a future that we need to change. What we can do is, is work with the future for the betterment of all of our children. Tell our story and move forward for a better way of life for everybody. Treaties are our way of life. Your ancestors and my ancestors signed those treaties. We're all treated people. And we're all in this together. So I'm going to try, <clears throat> I'm going to try something a little bit different, I uh, guess, uh, Technology isn't working for me this time. I've done this treaty education presentation probably 30 or 40 times. That's the next YouTube video. That's <laughs> But that's a good one. I'm going to leave that up. It's a good screen. So that's the next video on YouTube. But uh, we, we shared that video. We created it for the first time. We launched it on October 18th of this year, of uh, 2018. And within the first six months, we have more than 39,000 views of that video and more than 1,000 shares on Facebook. So we're really proud of it. Uh, treaty education, I'm really proud of it. Uh, uh, you know, as a person who's grown up with treaty education. And when I say I've grown up with treaty education, uh, I was very fortunate growing up, is that uh, my mom, Dr. Marie Baptiste, she was the first Mi'kmaq uh, PhD. 
Now, my mom, when she agreed to be the director of education and the principal of the Mi'kmaq School back in the 80s, told the community that she'd only agree to take the position if she was allowed to teach Mi'kmaq curriculum. And so I grew up learning about the treaties, learning about Mi'kmaq language. Every day we started our day reciting the prayers in Mi'kmaq, learning Smith Francis orthography. You know, we had some amazing teachers in that school, Elizabeth Ryan Paul, uh, you know, we had John Jerome uh, Paul, you know, some amazing people from Eskasoni and Budledek working in this small school for about, you know, 20 to 30 students. And I grew up believing that everyone was getting the same education that I was getting about treaties, about who we were. So I grew up with a lot of pride about who I was as a Mi'kmaq. When I went to Saskatchewan for high school, you know, I remember it was, a, it was it's such a culture shock moving from the reserve to a city. And when I moved there, I remember some of the classmates, you know, when I told them, you know, I was a Mi'kmaq person, I was First Nation. I remember one of the comments is, why would you admit to that? I couldn't understand it at that, you know, within my first time, because I came a place with great pride about who I was, but then within Saskatchewan, I realized there's a very different view of Indigenous people. But, uh, and, and, and the reason, you know, I, I, you know, the Chiefs offered me this position in 2015. I was working for the Chiefs on another file, and they thought it'd be good. But they thought it'd be good because, you know, within the Mi'kmaq culture, they have this word, Don Wedebeksin. Where are you from? But it's not more than where are you from, it's a question about where are your roots, who are you? And whenever you meet elders in different communities, they'll often ask you, And so you always have to tell people where your roots are, who your family is. And, and I, you know, when I do that, I always tell people, you know, my mother, Dr. Marie Batiste from Budladek, and my father uh, is a Chickasaw Indian from Oklahoma. My parents met at Harvard University. Uh, my mom was taking her master's in education. My father was in the Native American uh, legal program there, and my mom needed a tutoring in a, in a from the uh, a tutor that was indigenous uh, for the course called Education Law. And so, because of Education Law and because of its difficulty, that's how my parents met. And then, you know, ten years later, I I'm here <laughs> and still here in uh, Mi'kma'ki. And and so. When the chiefs looked at me, you know, my mother was integral uh, to building bicultural, bilingual education within, uh, within uh, Nova Scotia. And my father was one of the first advocates uh, of treaty education. And I was out in California with a Spanish name, Jaime, you know, that they, they always assumed that, uh, that they moved back to California. Uh, but, you know, Alec Denny, Grand Captain of the Mi'kmaq Nation in the late 70s convinced them convinced my parents to come back to Mi'kmaq and help re, uh, reclaim our culture, our language, and do the research on the treaties. And so if you think about my father, who's the treaty guru, and my mother, who's the education guru, treaty education just was not only something that was a job that was created for me, it was kind of a, a, a lifetime of learning at the tables and listening conversations of, with uh, my father and people like Joe B. Marshall, Alec Denny, Albert Marshall, Merdina Marshall. These are people that I grew up listening to around the, around the table. And, you know, I always remembered, you know, being kind of resentful as a child that my, my dad would say, Hi, me, come here, Chua. Listen, listen to this conversation. And so I'd be listening to adults have these complex conversations about Mi'kmaq law and history, and I'd rather be outside playing with the guys, but you know what, they, uh, because of that, I, I grew up with the kind of treaty education mentality. And so treaty education, uh, really, we, we, when we started looking at this, you know, we said, it was a comment from the province, I said on the Tripartite Education Committee, that said, you know, Nova Scotia is lagging behind all of the other provinces when it comes to treaty education. This was in 2014. And I looked at Eleanor Bernard at the time, and I said, so, and we looked at each other, and we said, so what are you gonna do about that? The province is saying that there's a challenge. We need to face that challenge. What can we do? So we began the planning process in 2015. We had a, a meeting in Member 2, you know, where we, and I, I said in the video, we brought together all the people. We brought the education, the elders, the government, the youth, the Mi'kmaq leadership, to get into a room and talk about treaty education. And uh, 
I'm really, I'm really happy with the, the Speakers Bureau Treaty Education pamphlet that's there. Because we just created this, and it's just new this month. And it's all about talking to people who've never understood about the Mi'kmaq, you know, a little bit about us. And so the first thing most people ask me is, you know, Jaime, what do, what do we say? I want to be politically correct. And, uh, you know, the first term that gets often gets thrown out is native, native people. But native people can be anything. Like, uh, if you're a native of somewhere, you can be a native of Manitoba or a native Cape Bretoner. That doesn't mean you're, you're Mi'kmaq. It just means you, you're from that location. The next term, Indian, is a very mis... You know, people, people believe that in 1492, Columbus was sailing to find this country called India, and he stumbled upon us, and that's when he said, oh, there's the Indians. Well, if you look at the history books, there was no such country in 1492 called India. It was called Hindustan. The more plausible explanation for the word Indian is the, the Spanish word for God's people, Indios. And if you look at it from that point of view, instead of looking at the false narrative about Columbus trying to find India, it makes a little bit, it was not as offensive. But in the 80s, our chiefs wanted a stronger word because there was now a country called India and it was confusing. And so the chief said, we don't want to be called Indians anymore, we want to be called First Nations. To say, we're the First Nations of Canada. And so they started using that. But there's no legal definition for the word First Nations. So they started with this other term in the Constitution of Canada called Aboriginal. And in the 1982 Constitution of Canada, Aboriginal is Indians, Métis, and Inuit. So Métis refers to the mixed heritage of, of a distinct culture that was born out of Manitoba and, and the West. It's not about mixed ancestry. If you have Mi'kmaq blood and Scottish blood, that doesn't make you Métis. Métis is about a distinct culture that came out of Manitoba. As of right now, in Canada, Métis are recognized kind of Ontario West. There is no legal recognition of Métis in the Atlantic. Not to say that that can never happen, but they have yet to demonstrate in courts that there was a distinct Métis community in the Atlantic. Uh, the other words, you know, you, you hear half-breed, don't use that, that's offensive. Uh, Inuit, this is uh, something that the First Nations, well, the first people living in northern Canada. These are the original inhabitants of the area, it's called Inuit. Now lately, over the past year, or largely because of the Indi Declaration of Rights of the Indigenous People, <laughs> which were the Mi'kmaq were actually integral in helping get created, uh, some of the first drafters were advocates for the Mi'kmaq Grand Council, but the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of the Indigenous People began using this word internationally called indigenous, and it was accepted internationally. <coughs> But you'll, some, one thing you'll notice about the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, there is no definition of who's indigenous and who's not. And so, indigenous is a very safe word to use. If you're talking about Mi'kmaq specifically, use the word Mi'kmaq. If you want to talk about the people of you know, the nations across Canada, they, they prefer First Nations. So, one of the things I want to get into before I get into the kind of history, which I'll try to do in about 15 minutes uh, to, to do the video, but. Um, you know, the Mi'kmaq have, uh, the territorial Mi'kmaq is the area of Mi'kmaq, the stretches all from Cape Breton to Newfoundland all the way to the peninsula in Quebec. And there are seven traditional areas. One of the things about Mi'kmaq, before I get into the treaty, before I get into the history, is there was a very different philosophy on, on life and worldview that the Mi'kmaq had as opposed to uh, the people they were signing the treaties with, the British and the French. Now, as a Mi'kmaq person, you're born with certain responsibilities. You're born with responsibilities to your community, to your family, to your nation, but also to your ecosystem, your environment. Mi'kmaq do, did not believe, and some you know, still today do not believe, that we are above our environment. We believe we are attached to our environment. The common you know, quote that I use is Chief Seattle, he says, man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. And so Mi'kmaq did not believe that you could own the land, that you could own the mountains, that you could own the waters, that you could own the rivers. 
To indigenous people, saying we own all of these things was like me saying right now today, oh, I own the air. No one breathe this air right here. This is mine. Can't breathe it. But within the, the British philosophy, when during the treaty making period, you could own just about anything. You could own land, you could own a lake, you could own a river, you could own animals, you could even own people. Everything was bought and sold commodity. And if within there, there are systems of governance. If the king said that he agrees to this and the king said this, then that was it. That was, everyone else had to follow those laws. The Mi'kmaq Grand Chief didn't have that same belief. The Mi'kmaq Grand Chief is a democratic belief. You'll hear Grand Captain Andale Denny to this day, highest ranking member of the Mi'kmaq Grand Council. And he says, I'm just a man. No better or no worse than anyone else. Our leader, our national leader, our you know, national government, his full-time job, he's a janitor, custodian. That's how he makes his money. He doesn't get that from, from being the grand captain of the Mi'kmaq Nation. There's no paycheck that comes along with just a lifetime of responsibility. And uh, as well, you know, we don't have a grand chief right now. Rest in peace, Ben Silverboy. But, you know, our next grand chief, he won't get a full-time salary either. He'll get a lifetime of going to Budladek and going to meetings where there's no electricity, no, no running water, no toilets, often no food, no heat, and you get to meet in a cabin. And, and people always talk about, well, how come you should make this person a grand counselor and this person a grand counselor? And they, they see all of the esteem and the power, but they don't see the humbleness that comes along with that governing structure. I always tell people, everyone wants to be on the Grand Council until they're on the Grand Council. <laughs> and then they see what, what it's really like. So I'm gonna go into the history, and I'm gonna do it a little bit differently than I do it normally, because we're lucky enough this year to have been able to create treaty education resources. And I wanna show a few of them that I'm really proud of. And so when we started talking about treaty education, we created a blueprint and said, how do we talk about, how do we talk to children about treaty education? And with children, you know, my son, you know, I remember talking to him the treaty day of that we signed the MOU. I wanted him to be there. And I said, Gwis, did you do go in the treaty? And he said, no. Did you do go treaty day? And I was trying to explain to him, how do I explain treaty day to a seven-year-old? And I said, this, this is about two groups willing to share. Not about fighting, they're not fighting over things. They said, we're gonna choose to share, and we're gonna choose harmony, and we're gonna choose peace over fighting over something. And so, with that in mind, we said, we need to start children young. We need to start talking to them about uh, treaties at a young age, and we need to build stories. But we also needed, within the schools, role models. Role models that children could look, look up to and see, oh, these are Mi'kmaq people that we're reading about. And so the first book we came up with was about George Paul and the Honor Song. And it's a beautiful story of how George went to the residential schools and had his culture and language taken away, but through his travels, through uh, song, through vision, through prayer, he was able to give a, be given a gift called the Honor Song, which is beautifully, you know, beautifully uh, illustrated by Loretta Gould from Wagoma. And the story really is about reclaiming who we are as Mi'kmaq through culture and song and the, and the lyrics of, of the honor song. The first part of history that I wanted children to talk about was Grand Chief Member Two. And in the States, they celebrate Thanksgiving every year, the pilgrims and natives coming together for the first time, and it's a great story that they talk about. But we had that here in Nova Scotia, no one talks about it. Grand Chief Member Two took the French under his wing, the first first year, many of the French died off. Grand Chief Member Two ensured that, the, the, that after the next group that came in, that he showed them where to fish, where to hunt, how to find medicine in the winter, how to find foods, and the exchange of, you know, music, the exchange of foods, and talks about all of these things. But it also talks about how Grand Chief Member Two is known as the first Mi'kmaq to be baptized. And I tell people, that when we're talking about baptism, and, and Mi'kmaq accepted Christianity, but they never gave up their traditional values. And one of the things that this was also a political decision, because in 1600s, the highest power in Europe wasn't kings and queens, it was the Pope. The Pope made the laws for all the people. And so, Member Two was instrumental 
in creating that peace and coexistence between the Mi'kmaq and, the, and what we now know as the, the French, but also the Acadian people down in that area. And I was told a story by the, the, the Lieutenant Governor, uh, LeBlanc, and he told me a story uh, that when his family, would, they were trying to expel all the Acadians, it was the Mi'kmaq communities that hid them and ensured that they weren't sent off to Louisiana. And so he's, he was forever grateful for the Mi'kmaq and to the Mi'kmaq people for his family being able to stay in Nova Scotia. The next story that we developed was about John Baptiste Cope and Edward Cornwallis. And the whole point of, you know, Cornwallis was told to go down to, and sail down and make peace with the Mi'kmaq. And instead of making peace, he, declared, he said that the Mi'kmaq declared war on him him because he was supposed to go to Port Royal and make treaties. He ended up going to Halifax where he wasn't supposed to be. The Sibinagati district asked him, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. And then he said, oh, well, the Mi'kmaq have declared war against us. Let's, let's kill them all. But the Mi'kmaq were an extreme fighting force in the, in the 1700s. They controlled the eastern seaboard. And in one year, they took 21 British ships. So this is this is a well-oiled machine, as one would say, is the Mi'kmaq. And so killing them off, or trying to exterminate them, didn't work so well for Cornwallis. And it was going so poorly that he said, we can't win this war, we need help from others. Let's put a bounty on Mi'kmaq scalps for every man, woman, and child. And they put a bounty on all of us as Mi'kmaq, on General Cornwallis. And that's why they took his statue down, because no one should be talking about, you know, we should never honor anyone who's asking to commit genocide on men, women, and children, wherever you're from. And so, but, I, but the Grand Chief of Jam, the, the story of John Baptiste Cope is a story of bravery. And despite having a bounty on his head, when a new governor came in and said, oh, we want to make peace with the Mi'kmaq, could have been a trap. They could have captured him and killed him. But they were able to negotiate a peace because the Mi'kmaq wanted peace. They want, didn't want to continue to fight with the British. And so the 1752 treaty was all about peace, friendship, and trade. And so that was an amazing thing. However, unfortunately, much in 1776, a major event occurred in North America. We had the, you know, the American Revolution, and all of these loyalists went down, and all these loyalists didn't want to side with the Americans, so they fought for, for Britain. And once the American Revolution was won by the Americans in 1776, all of these loyalists needed somewhere to go. And it wasn't cost effective to send them all back to Europe on ships, so they sent them into Canada. And all of a sudden, the population multiplied. In 10 years, the population multiplied in the British Empire 16 times. So if, imagine how full this room is. Imagine. Everyone in this room bringing another 16 people. And so in the Atlantic, you know, the treaty started being ignored. In 1848, the Grand Council submitted a petition to the, the, the British and, and, to, and to Nova Scotia and said, you know, we've signed these treaties and no one's following them. And so in 1748, they did a study and they realized that there wasn't a jury in the land that would side with the Mi'kmaq. There wasn't a lawyer in the land who would represent the Mi'kmaq, and there was no judge in the land that would harm his reputation by siding with the Mi'kmaq. And so the Mi'kmaq couldn't get justice. And we've seen that over the years that followed. The Mi'kmaq could not get justice. In 1915, the Member 2 community was originally down on the water where they could travel to see their neighbors, their friends, their families. They were moved up to this area in Member 2 here. And the court case, the actual court case, states in 1915, that no one wants to live next to the unsightly Indians, that the Mi'kmaq were a clog in development, that we retarded progress. One of the ironies of history, though, if you look around Cape Breton 100 years later, Member 2 is the largest growing area in, this, in Cape Breton. And that land that they were kicked off of for being unsightly neighbors and clogs in development, Member 2 so rich, they bought that land back. <laughs> so, it, it shows, it just shows it, you know, what people's vision of us, of us was in those days. But unfortunately, that trend continued. And in 1928, our Grand Chief Gabriel Sillaboy went to court and said, I have treaties. He was charged with hunting muskrats out of season, three days after the, the season ended. And went to court in Sydney. And once again, 
Racism showed its face in our courts, and they said the savages' right of sovereignty or ownership was never recognized. These treaties aren't valid. Basically, there was no such thing as the Mi'kmaq Grand Council. All of these, you know, racist assumptions. And so, our Grand Chief, you know, went to his deathbed believing that he let his people down. But the end of this story talks about the current era that we're in, the reconciliation era, in that we went back to court in 1985. 1985, the Simon case was the first case. We lost all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supreme Court of Canada, they looked at the evidence and looked at the, the research that was done. A lot of it by my father in, in, the, in the areas of, of, of looking through the archives in Nova Scotia and said, yes, this is a valid treaty. And in 1752, everything changed for the Mi'kmaq. It was a major turning point for us. So now we were not, we were just, we weren't just looking at to the government and saying, you know, can you, you know, help our bands that are underfunded. We said, no, 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 we have rights. We're going to go implement those rights. But in 1985, we weren't as progressive as we are today. In 1985, you know, the province and the federal government said, well, we understand the Supreme Court of Canada case, you guys won that, but we don't believe that that applies to all Mi'kmaq. We believe it only applies to James Matthew Simon from Sibinagadi. And so, okay, we said, all right, we understand that. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to the Highlands. We're gonna go hunt some moose. Here's when we're gonna do it. Here's where we're gonna do it. Come charge us. Sure enough, they took the bait, they came charge us. And within a year, they realized that the evidence that they had against our hunters was so pitiful that they couldn't even make an argument. They walked out of court. They didn't even wait for the court to make a decision. They walked out. Following year, we got our fishing rights in the Denny Paul Silliboy case. Probably the most, the greatest case for the Mi'kmaq in 1999 stated that the Mi'kmaq not only had a right to fish, but we had a right to fish commercially, that we could cr create an economy for ourselves, that we could begin not only surviving in the Atlantic, but actually being a part of the economy, creating money for ourselves. And our communities have sprung up amazingly because of that. 2007, the last of the Supreme Court of Canada cases that we've gone through, we, re, we, we were able to be successful in getting our domestic logging, which means we can go to the woods, get our own wood for heat, wood for furniture, and wood for housing. This is a right that the Mi'kmaq possess. So, in 1999 though, the, the judge said something very profound and said, stop litigating with the Mi'kmaq. They have treaties, accept it, it's now time to negotiate and reconcile. And so that's where we're at now, in negotiation and reconciliation. And people may say it takes, it's taken a long time, you know, we've had these court cases and we're still in poverty and things like that. But Marmi Ma are growing and the economy is growing and our leadership knows the importance of these treaties and are in no hurry to take any offers that were given. We, they don't want to be, you know, an offer at one check and then it'd be gone. They want to be partners partners in protecting our environment, partners in having a say in what resources we extract from the land, partners in governance. This is what the Mi'kmaq is looking for moving forward. And so treaty education today is really what we're trying to do is we know that most Nova Scotians didn't grow up with this knowledge. And we know that we need to inform these children, we need to inform teachers, and treaty education, we know that the Failures of one generation are the opportunities of the next. And the next generation, we hope, grows up hearing these stories about the Mi'kmaq, hearing about, in every, as, as the Premier said, in every grade, every school, every grade, every school, every class across Nova Scotia. And that's where we're building towards. And so right now we're in the process of building these resources. We started with, we've got P to six that we've rolled out this year and we did our first PD uh, last month on these, we're rolling those out to the to the non-Mi'kmaq schools over the next year. We're building the grade seven to nine resources, 10 to 12 resources, and so this is all happening within treaty education, and we're very proud of that. Not only that, but we also, all of those people on those videos that we're talking, with the exception of Chief Bob Lode, are members of a speakers bureau that go all across Nova Scotia. So it's not just me anymore going to classrooms, presenting in front of these. I have a group of 18 and I'm trying to build off of that in every community, in every region, to have more people trained to talk about treaty education. And so we have speakers available. We you know, we know that not everyone can afford to bring speakers in. So we help from the, with the province and with the Mi'kmaq and 
You know, what, what we started with is, and I'll tell you this, we started in this building, a few chiefs having a conversation with me. They said, Jaime, we'll invest 10,000 each in five communities, and we want you to go out to the province and federal government and secure the rest of that. I left my other job, took that 50,000 investment. Today, treaty education is a half a million dollar operating budget each year moving forward. It's been successful because of the message. And the message has always been, we are all in this together. When the Mi'kmaq succeed, Nova Scotia will succeed. New Brunswick will succeed. We cannot no longer have communities without drinking clean drinking water. We need us all in this together. And so the last video that I'm gonna show, and then I'll take some questions, is the treaty education short video that we had playing in all kinds of videos all across uh, Nova Scotia. And let me just check again, treaty education Nova Scotia, and voila. Can we talk? Because we are all in this together. Because words matter. Because words become agreements. Become alliances. Between people. And nations. Because talking reminds us of who we were. Two groups of people who are willing to share. Because words define our obligations. And shape how we think about each other. And ourselves. And how we act <laughs> towards each other. As people. As a, a nation. Because words become ideas. And ideals. Democracy. Inclusivity. Canada. Because talking tells us who we might become. Groups of people. Willing to share. Can we talk? Because talking matters. Because words matter. Because treaties matter. <laughs> so, can we talk? Because we are all treaty people. We're all in this together. And so if there's no other questions, that's my presentation. Lalio. No questions? Any, I'll be here for the next 10 minutes, Lalio. And if you can, I'm going to just want just one last thing before I go. I have to talk a little, because it's a language conference. I want to talk a little bit about the Il Nudal project that, uh, that we did. And it'll just be five minutes. I want to show a video. And this video, this came about this video and the, the project for the CDs and the Mi'kmaq music by my son. Well, I think none of you know that treaties were signed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That might be it. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna let you do this one and then I'm... So that's the video for our Omnu Doll CD. I'm selling CDs over there. We wanted to create new music in the Mi'kmaq language. And I told people at the beginning of, the pro of this project 
The burden for language cannot just be on our teachers. The burden for language cannot just be on our children. It has to be on our entertainers, our leaders. Everyone has to be creating new Mi'kmaq songs, Mi'kmaq poetry, Mi'kmaq stories. If we're going to carry out, if we're going to continue to build the language, it can't just be immersion schools. It has to be in the music, it has to be in the culture, it has to be in our storytelling. And so we created 20 new songs in the Mi'kmaq language. And so that's, and the person who recorded this, when we said we're going to do a live album, do all of these things live for the first time ever, we had this concert. Our engineer this year, Scott Ferguson, won the ECMA for producer of the year and engineer, musical engineer of the year and studio of the year. So based on a lot of this stuff that we're doing, this, this is a production by the best producer this year in the Atlantic. So I'm very proud of Scott for that and I'm proud of the musician being part of that. Blackbird, that's only possible because we went out and we challenged musicians and said, Sing in Mi'kmaq. It's time for us to reclaim our language. Sing in Mi'kmaq. Create new songs in Mi'kmaq. Let's get more out there. And I hope that next year we'll be able to do another one. So with that, we'll We'll be selling CDs in lunchtime. If any other questions everyone has, please feel free to uh, to call me. I almost said, feel free to vote. <laughs> <That's laughs> I almost, I almost, went, I almost went into my campaign mode. I've been using that message. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>